Well, hello friends, it's Tuesday and I pray your week is going well. And I tell you what, if you're starting the day off in the Word of God, your day is going to go well. Now, it may not, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to have some difficulties, encounter an obstacle or two, but it does mean that you've hidden the Word of God in your heart to guide you and how you want to respond to those situations appropriately and according to His Word. And you've already got the Holy Spirit working in you to understand that word and to guide you in how you respond as well. Speaking of guiding and the need for God's guidance, today we're looking at Acts chapter 20. And I'll go ahead and admit a, a bit of a, um, a bias toward these verses because they resonate with my heart. Because here you have Paul the Apostle, the founder of the churches, you know, many of the churches of the Asian area, and we're talking now about Ephesus. Coming back through the area, not going to Ephesus, but coming close by, calling the leaders to himself, and just being point blank honest with them. Stressing the importance of their diligence to protect the church. Stressing their imp the importance of their continuing to deliver the truth of the word of God, you know, and make sure it's accurate. And making sure that they're, they're, no one's allowed to come in and, and perpetuate a teaching that is contrary to the teaching that he gave them. So let's get right into it. Acts chapter 20. I want to look at verses 28 through 31. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. So the group he's talking to, if you go back up, I think it's in verse 18, he summoned to himself the elders of the church. He called, he called and said, hey, um, actually, yeah, it's verse 17, excuse me. Go back to verse 17. These are the elders in the church there. The elders would have been the leaders. It's a plurality of elders, which is a healthy leadership model, by the way. When they come to him, he says, hey, you know this, I did not, that, that you got to be on guard, you know, because you've been appointed by the Holy Spirit, you know, not just selected by me, you've been appointed by the Holy Spirit to be guardians of his church, the church which he purchased by his own blood. And then he goes on to talk about some of the, the challenges they'll face and some of the dangers that are lurking. First of all, one of the challenges he says, this, he says, savage wolves are going to come in among you, not sparing the flock. So he says, there's dangers from outside the church. You have people who will come in who maybe on the surface seem like just another uh, you know, average person. Uh, they're not going to come across as dangerous in any way. They're going to ease into fellowship and gain trust. And then as savage wolves, they're going to just totally destroy. They're going to begin to slowly create division and strife in the body. And they're going to you know, just try to destroy the church. He said, you got to be on guard against that. And the same is true for us, especially the leadership. If you're a pastor or you're a key leader in the church, your job is to be carefully perceptive of, of, the, you know, of the flock, of what's going on. And when you sense division arising, when you sense that there may be some strife among members, or when you sense that there's some teaching going on that is contrary to the Word of God, as you have been instructed by your t pastor or, or by, as you've been instructed by your, your uh, education, then it's our duty to confront that and then to demonstrate its faults and then remove it from the faith family. Uh, he says, hey, this is even going to happen. There's going to be men who are going to rise up from your own number. And notice what it says. They will distort the truth in order to deceive the disciples and gain their trust and gain their following. And we see it time and time again. Sometimes it happens with small group leaders in, in, a, in, a, more, in, you know, in a more subtle sense. Sometimes it happens in a larger scale where you have a church called pastor. Um, they'll come in and, and over a slow period of time, they'll m distort the truth and they'll move people away from a solid biblical foundation regarding things like salvation, uh, you know, things, uh, you know, other different doctrinal positions that are essential to the uh, health and, and continued growth of the church. Uh, we've seen it time and time again. We see it happen in denominations today. One of the most dangerous and destructive truths that's being perpetuated in some of the most historical denominations of our, of, of our nation's history is the authority of Scripture, the, the, the dependency of Scripture, that Scripture is infallible, that's inerrant, that it was delivered by God, God-breathed. 
they begin to attack that doctrine. And when that doctrine is removed, when the, the doctrine of the authority of Scripture, the supremacy of Scripture is removed, then everything else crumbles. You have nothing else by which to establish any doctrinal truths on because the Bible is foundational. And so we've got to defend that doctrinal position. And so as a leader in our Lord's church, whether you're the pastor, whether you're an elder in the church, you know, even in, as a deacon, deacons are technically biblically servants. But deacons are to be sensitive to where division may be taken and distortions are taking place. And they are to alert the elders. They are to alert the uh, the pastor to what's taking place. And then together, collectively, they confront that distortion. And that was so important. And this was such a passion for Paul. Paul said, hey, I have warned you for years with tears, three years in fact, with tears that this is going to happen. And you've got to be alert and you've got to be diligent to preserve the unity of the faith and you've got to be diligent to preserve the, the integrity of the teaching. You've got to do that. And the same is true for us. Now, we know that about two or three years after this visit, this visit was somewhere in 58 AD, sometime around you know three to four years later, Paul would write a letter back to this church. And obviously, some teaching had arisen that had begun to distort the gospel that he gave to them. And so Paul began to, to make some corrective teachings through that marvelous book of Ephesians. We know that the book of Ephesians is where we get some of our, our, our greatest declarations of salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace you are saved through faith. You know, And then, less than about 10 years or so after that visit, um, Paul's going to write two more letters. These are going to be letters to his son, the faith, Timothy. And what's so uh, alarming is that in just a decade, in just a decade, that's those second, those other two letters, Timothy and 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Both of them speak to the fact that there were men in the church who were distorting the truth, who were teaching, that, who were presenting a teaching that was contrary to the word that Paul had presented and that was in contradiction to the truth of Scripture. At that point, Scripture for them would have been the Old Testament, but all of the Old Testament uh, prophesies of Christ. And so if that was true in, in that day and time, they, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have some of the technology we have that makes information so prevalent and makes it so easy for false teachings to find its way into the church. Just imagine what that says for us today. We must be diligent. You know, we've got to uh, be on guard against false teaching coming into the church, uh, creating division in the church, destroying the truth, and then ultimately destroying my Lord's church. And that's our responsibility, leaders. If you're a pastor, that is your responsibility. And God forbid you be the key, you be the source of the distortion. And if that be the case, then the leaders uh, you know, around you, your leaders, your, your church board, your elders, your deacons, however that's structured for you, they should be the ones to then confront you. Uh, and then deacons, church council members, elders, whatever your position, we must be diligent to preserve the unity of the faith and to preserve the integrity of Scripture. Because if we don't do that, then we can rest assured the church it's absolutely not going to stand. It just won't stand because it doesn't have a doctrinal foundation on which it must be built, established, and sustained. Well, friends, my heart is grieved because I see a lot of what Paul warned about taking place in his church today, the church in America. There's such a push to be attractional. There's such a push to be non-confrontational with the, the, the ebb and flow of a secular humanist worldview. And the church is capitulating, and it's breaking my heart, because that's not our that's not our call. That, that, that that's not our 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 mission. Our mission is to present the truth with love and compassion, but with full authentic truth. And when we do that, we are going to face opposition. We are going to encounter uh, differences of opinion and things of that nature. That's why we go back to the Word of God. So let this be a warning to us as well that we need to be on guard that we need to be intentional, and as I say every day, we've got to be in the Word of God so the Word of God gets into us. Well, I pray that your week has started well, and I pray today's lesson will be just one more addition to helping your week continue to go well as we are faithful to live sent.